Welcome back to our third meeting of the, on the Beyond the McCone Report. Such a, a lovely day as it's been in Los Angeles, and again, evening. I'm surprised to see anyone here, but I'm very glad you are. And I think we're in for a very uh, interesting and uh, exciting subject tonight. Um, you, we've heard about law enforcement, and we've talked about education, and now we're going into what um, the McCone, recall, re McCone Report calls the most serious immediate problem is employment. Uh, I was interested in this week in seeing a report on uh, something that Leon Kaiserling had said in Chicago. Leon Kaiserling, as you probably know, is president of the Conference on Economic Progress. And in a speech in Chicago this week, he was saying again that the single biggest poverty problem is lack of jobs. He said that after the government provides the environment for private industry, and I quote, it is a basic federal responsibility to provide jobs for the people nobody else employs. We're very fortunate in having as the consultant of the evening, uh, one of the consultants to the McCone Commission, Paul Bullock. Uh, Paul Bullock uh, is assistant research economist in the Institute of Industrial Relations here on the campus a graduate of Occidental College, where he received both his bachelor's and his master's degrees. He has been uh, not only a consultant to the McCone Commission, but also to the Los Angeles Urban League. I was interested in the list of publications that Mr. Bullock has to see the following titles that I think fit into our subject for this evening. Combating Discrimination in Employment, the Minority Youngster in the Schools, which was published in The Progressive, What to Do with the Dropout, Some Problems in Minority Group Education in the Los Angeles Public Schools, Employment Problems of the Mexican American, and a monumental study, not only it's an important, but also in its size, a, a real tome, isn't it? How much does it weigh, Mr. Bullock? I'd say about 30 tons. <laughs> a study that's called the Hardcore Unemployment and Poverty in Los Angeles, uh, for which uh, Mr. Bullock was the project supervisor. And then a last one that I want to mention uh, from Frontier in Poverty in the Ghetto. Well, all of these, I think, well qualify Mr. Bullock to address us tonight on employment and its importance in regard to the McCone Commission report. After Mr. Bullock addresses us, we will have a short break, and then three members will be joining Mr. Bullock in a panel discussion. Mr. Bullock. Let me say, first of all, that I'm suffering from the beginnings of uh, a cold, and so if I should sneeze in the middle of a sentence, I hope you will forgive me, but that seems to be the way that things go these days. Looking back over the approximately six months that have passed since issuance of the McCone Commission report and the ten months since the riot itself, I am struck by the contrast between the vast amount of activity reported in the press, employment and training programs, educational reforms, urban renewal plans, a hospital bond issue, and so on, and the absence of any concrete and tangible changes in the Watts area itself. Let me just add at this point that there have been programs that have been initiated in the Watts area, the Neighborhood Legal Services, the added programs through the Westminster Neighborhood Association, and so on. But it seems to me that these programs have not had the visibility to a great many people in the community that they might have had. In all this time, the one improvement visible to the youngsters in the community has been the establishment of Watts Happening, a coffee house and jazz center on 103rd Street, and now a city building and safety commission, which I think has been notoriously slow 
in correcting substandard residential housing owned by absentee landlords has moved in to close what's happening on a technicality. Granted that bureaucracy traditionally moves slowly and reluctantly, particularly where the interests of the poor are concerned, the lack of measurable progress can only make more violence inevitable as we approach the critical summer period again. Since we are focusing on employment this evening, perhaps a short refresher on the McComb Commission's recommendations in this area would be in order. After describing briefly but accurately the social and economic consequences of unemployment and the seriousness of the problem, the employment chapter of the report determines that all the existing and proposed programs are insufficient to meet the need. Then it mentions Governor Brown's proposal for a national effort to finance useful jobs for the unemployed and the underemployed, costing about two and a half billion dollars annually on a national scale and about 250 million dollars in California which would provide about 50,000 new jobs throughout the state. Looking at the Brown proposal with a mixture of sympathy and skepticism, the McCone report finally dismisses it as impractical in the light of the fiscal demands of Vietnam escalation and fears of inflation. Ironically, the Brown proposal to the President and to the Secretary of Labor has been, I think, the boldest and most imaginative plan offered at any time. And yet it has received very little concrete support from the very groups and individuals that have been demanding bold leadership and far-reaching programs. Only within the last week has the United Civil Rights Council, a kind of omnibus umbrella organization of civil rights organizations, in the Negro community expressed a strong public interest in precisely this proposal. The McCone Report then commends the then existing training and job placement programs, especially a committee of the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce headed by Harold C. McClellan. It condemns certain labor union practices which inhibit the employment of Negroes. And then it makes the most important policy recommendation in the employment area. Establishment within the Negro community of a training and, and placement program which parallels the so-called Opportunities Industrialization Center in Philadelphia, initiated there by the Reverend Leon Sullivan. The Commission calls for an end to racial discrimination, but omits a recommendation contained in an earlier draft of the report asking for a general strengthening of the powers of FEPC in this state. Instead, it advocates legislation empowering FEPC to require the submission of reports on ethnic composition of the workforce by employers of more than 250 workers and by all labor unions. By thus limiting the scope of the legislation to larger employers, the recommendation excludes those many firms in which discrimination is practiced, I think, with great frequency. The report goes on to make reference to police arrest records as an additional barrier to employment for many persons. This, incidentally, was a statement added by staff members and by the consultant to the commission to the original draft of the report, which, which was prepared by Mr. McCone himself in terms of the employment section. And then it urges employers to review their hiring policies in an effort to increase employment opportunities for persons in this particular category, that is, persons who have a police arrest record. Unfortunately, this is not made a part of the, of the report's formal recommendations and is only hortatory in nature. 
Hence, it has never received much attention, though the problem with which it deals is one of the most critical in the entire South Central area of Los Angeles. I might add, just as, a, as an aside here, that the effect of police practices or malpractices in the Los Angeles area, South Los Angeles area, has never been um, revealed to me in its full extent until the last few months because I had always concentrated on the immediate physical and emotional impact of police practices upon the individuals. But what I hadn't realized till recently, in at least the degree to which I should have realized it, is that police practices in one section of the community which lead to further arrest records of persons who live in that particular area can inhibit the employment, can in many ways follow that individual throughout his entire lifetime career. And it is this aspect of police practices as well as the immediate harassment that is involved that I think a great many of us have not considered to the degree that we should. The employment section of the McCone Report then ends with a repetition of what the Commission regards as its major re uh, recommendations. Number one, a job training and placement center through the combined efforts of Negroes, employers, labor unions, and government. Secondly, assurances by federal and state governments through new facilities and better communication that maximum advantage is taken of the various training programs and employment opportunities. Third and last, the recommended legislation re requiring reports from employers and labor unions to the FEPC relative to the ethnic composition of the workforce and the membership of the labor unions. These recommendations, in my judgment, range from, say, innocuous, which would be number two about assurances of communication and so on, to, I think, useful and affirmative in principle. And that would be the first recommendation as to a job training and placement center in the Negro community itself. But by no stretch of the imagination can any one of them be labeled bold. The role assigned to government is a relatively limited one, reflecting the chairman's own pre predilections in this regard. Throughout the McCone Report, there are several references to the need for evidence of initiative from and within the Negro community itself, with the implication, it seems to me, that the community has resisted its responsibilities in the past. The principle that the minority community should assume a more meaningful role in the planning and administration of anti-poverty programs is a le legitimate one, widely accepted within the Negro community itself, and indeed the very basis for a community demand that the poor be given a more effective representation in the management of existing programs. When, however, the advocacy of this principle is linked with an implication that Negroes currently are unwilling and unprepared to accept such responsibility, and that this explains much of their plight in the current American society, I think the result is merely to bolster some of the more vicious stereotypes of prejudiced whites to antagonize many Negroes and thereby discredit an otherwise sound proposal. In this respect, then, I think the report manages to strike the worst possible balance. Six months later, at approximately the time when the Commission is scheduled to reconvene, it can boast that its major recommendation in the employment field, the training and placement center within the Negro community, has become a reality. The new OIC, the Opportunities Industrialization Center, has opened an intake and counseling office in Watts, 
and a large training facility in another section of the South Central area, financed by a $450,000 grant from the Ford Foundation. Another substantial grant has gone to the Management Council for Merit Employment, which is an outgrowth of Harold McClellan's original Chamber of, of Commerce uh, organization, to develop jobs for the graduates of these training courses. Meanwhile, Mr. McClellan's committee has announced that it has placed 4,671 persons from the curfew area into jobs between September 1st of last year and early April of this year. The OIC prospectus sounds hopeful, and if it duplicates the previous program in Philadelphia, it can make a major contribution. In all frank frankness, the prospects for success are considerably more crowd clouded in Los Angeles than in Philadelphia. Reverend Hill, chairman of the local OIC board, is mainly noted for his close association with the Yorty administration at City Hall. And to put it mildly, I think he lacks the community-wide stature and respect enjoyed by Reverend Sullivan in Philadelphia. Sullivan had organized and led several boycotts, successful boycotts, of Philadelphia firms, and by this means inducing them to increase their employment of Negroes before he assumed the direction of OIC. Hill in Los Angeles has no comparable record, and it remains uncertain whether the local governing board, which uh, hopefully at least represents several different segments of the Negro community, will be sufficiently strong to build confidence and provide leadership. Under any circumstances, the chaotic and opportunistic political context under which such an operation functions in Los Angeles makes its path infinitely more difficult. Evaluating the success of this program and all the others that have been or will be in, a, in effect throughout Los Angeles County is a thankless task. Despite our boasted sophistication in economic and technical matters and the recent strides in computer technology, the incontrovertible fact is that we have little precise knowledge of the amount and severity of unemployment by sub-areas of the county, such as Watts or Willowbrook or any other sub-area that you can name, we did not know at the time of the August riot, nor at the time that the McCone report was prepared, nor do we know today with any real precision the figures on unemployment rates, the extent of physical and emotional deprivation, the effectiveness of existing retraining programs, or any of the other critical information needed to evaluate prog progress and form the basis for intelligent decisions. The statistics on unemployment offered in the McComb Commission report are simply guesses, much above the, quote, official, unquote, figures from the 1960 regular and the 1965 special censuses, but probably not too far off the mark. The simple fact is that the poor, and especially the minority poor, apparently do not show up in full measure in the censuses and surveys. They are harder to reach, suspicious of poll takers, and conscious of real or imagined threats to their security if the wrong answers are given. The special census conducted in November of 1965 counted about 5,000 fewer people in Watts than the population estimate for roughly the same area by the City Planning Commission as of October 1965. About 9,000 fewer people in the Avalon area. About 6,000 in the Central area. About 4,000 in the Exposition area, and so on. All of these areas are the official areas defined by the Los Angeles City Planning Commission. In the total South Central area, which is almost the size of the curfew zone, the 1965 census put the aggregate male and female unemployment figure at about 11,700. 
much below the McCone Commission estimate of 25,000 for Negroes alone in that area. Yet every indication is that the city planning estimates of population are much closer to the truth than the census. And if this is so, the figures on unemployment must be similarly understated. If even the official figures in the, from the U.S. Census Bureau are in question, the problems facing anyone seeking to evaluate the area's economy become virtually insurmountable. Of course, the, the absence of reliable data has not inhibited a great many people from offering very precise figures on unemployment in Watts and in other parts of the county. I have heard, uh, for instance, the figure of 30% sometimes cited uh, as the unemployment rate in Watts. And the only reasonable basis I could ever find for such a figure is the approximately 30% rate for men only in one census tract in 1960. The entire county of Los Angeles is considered to be a labor market area for official purposes. In fact, until a few years ago, it was Los Angeles and Orange Counties, but Orange County has now seceded and achieved independence. And the only regularly available estimate of unemployment, which is published monthly by the Department of Employment, is for the county as a whole. So because unemployment rates and family incomes are, are thus averaged together for Watts and Willowbrook and Bel Air and Brentwood and Beverly Hills and the San Fernando, Fernando Valley and Long Beach and so on, Los Angeles area, for some strange reason, is not eligible for special assistance as a redevelopment area under the Public Works and Economic Development Act of 1965. Although there are bills in the hopper to change the designation formula so as to qualify these urban pockets of poverty for assistance, the administration's refusal to recommend appropriations equal to even the modest authorization in the, in the legislation itself must severely limit the amount of aid that can be expected from this quarter. Possibly this, this points up the basic dilemma that confronts us in this employment sector. We do not face a problem of mass unemployment as this nation did in the 1930s. Instead, we have a, a generally affluent economy, a high level of employment, and even a fear of inflation. How much of this is due to government spending for military purposes and related purposes is another question. The employment we confront is selective in its impact, falling with particular force upon special groups such as Negroes and Mexican Americans, farm workers, the very poorly educated and the unskilled, some teenagers and some older persons, the handicapped and a few others. Regardless of any differences over exact figures, it's quite clear that the rate of unemployment among Negroes in Los Angeles County averages from two to three times the rate for the whole county, which probably means that it's three to four times the, rates for the rate for just the whites. The unemployment rate for Mexican Americans is not so dramatically high, but it persistently exceeds the corresponding rate for Anglos. Even so, I think the figures on unemployment tell us only a part of the story. They fail to indicate, for instance, the extent of poverty among those who are not in the labor force, many of whom would probably, probably enter the labor force if there were jobs available under reasonable conditions. They do not fully reflect the serious intermittency of, um, of employment for many persons. About 29% of experienced Negro workers are out of work at some time during the year. Or the fact that many workers receive excessively low pay even when they are regularly employed. The 1960 census shows that more than one quarter of all families in the south central area of Los Angeles had incomes below the poverty line. And this is perhaps another typical under, understatement of the census. 
They do not tell us the number of people concentrated in dead-end jobs which are being or will soon be automated out of existence. They explain nothing about the many in the poverty ghettos who are, who are impelled to seek their livelihood through illicit or I illegal practices, which often bring them into conflict with the law and thereby com compound their difficulties. Needless to say, a disproportionate number of youngsters from the minority groups are conveniently removed from the civilian labor force by the draft. Others are employed at low pay, that is about $1.27 an hour, part-time work, such as the neighborhood youth corps. Of course, we are almost inundated by figures on governmental and private programs which allegedly are placing large numbers of the South Los Angeles unemployed in employment and training. The Neighborhood Youth Corps, special service centers run by the Department of Employment, State Employment Service, the Management Council of Mr. McClellan and the OIC that I mentioned before, Operation Bootstrap, which is one of the few genuinely indigenous operations in the South Central area, the various MDTA training programs administered by the Department of Labor and the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. The special youth training and employment program administered through the Economic and Youth Opportunities Agency, EYOA, in Los Angeles County. The Urban League's on-the-job training program and countless other activities. In fact, if, if you were to add up all the subtotals of these programs, the training programs and the employment programs that have been uh, put into effect since August of last year, you'd find that the resulting figure would be approximately the same as the unemployment total for South Central Los Angeles that comes out of the 1965 census. So uh, where do we stand? Is it true that the unemployment problem then is well, well on its way to solution? Unfortunately, I think there's very, very little likelihood that it is. While the statistics are incomplete, it would appear that the existing programs have primarily taken the cream of the unemployed and the underemployed, the somewhat better educated and better skilled, the less alienated youngsters, those without felony arrest records, and those whose physical and emotional health is unmarred. The remaining unemployed or underemployed are the hardcore, people who are, quote, unemployable, unquote, from the viewpoint of private business and government itself. They, they do not fit readily, if indeed they fit at all, into the predominantly middle-class oriented structure of American business. And their entry into employment will require not only the, acquisitions of, the acquisition of skills, but in many cases a change in attitudes and behavior patterns to make them employable in the conventional work situation. This is the philosophy behind the McComb Commission report and the practical demand of nearly all American employers, including those who do not directly discriminate on racial grounds. Overt racial discrimination remains a problem, especially, in my opinion, among the smaller and the medium-sized firms that seldom receive government contracts and are relatively untouched by FEPC and by other government anti-discrimination agencies. But I think of equal or perhaps of greater significance in the South Central area is the built-in cultural discrimination of middle-class Americans in favor of their own kind and, of course, the increasingly demanding skill and educational requirements on the job. The net result is that the unemployed Negroes in Watts and Willowbrook and the Avalon community and so on still fail to obtain remunerative employment, but the reasons are, or at least they appear to be, more subtle and complex than before. 
In large part, I think this explains. In large part, I think this explains why the people of South Central Los Angeles are not particularly aware of all these pre presumed effects of civil rights laws, anti-discrimination legislation, retraining programs, job placement efforts, and so on. In a 1964 survey that we conducted at the Institute of Industrial Relations here at UCLA, about three quarters of all Negroes in the South Central area that we interviewed had seen no evidence whatsoever of the effect of civil rights activity, of legislation, of boy boycotts and picketing and so on in the places of employment. And only about half of the total group had ever heard of retraining opportunities. None were enrolled in a training program at the time of the survey. The hardcore unemployed among them perceive, perceive their difficulties in the labor market as arising mainly from the disappearance of the kinds of jobs for which they have traditionally qualified, or putting it another way, their own lack of skill and education, or age or personal problems such as police records or bad health. Neither federal nor state FEP legislation can help these persons in any significant degree, particularly when government itself refuses to hire on precisely these same bases. If it is true that the existing programs fail to reach sufficient numbers of the most disadvantaged, despite the, um, the impressive overall statistics, the alternatives available to us narrow down to a discomforting few with varying degrees of political and institutional feasibility. Let's briefly consider the major possibilities. First of all, the McCone Commission takes the most conventional and obvious approach. If the unemployed lack basic skills in reading and mathematics, or if they need counseling and training along motivational or behavioral lines, remedial programs should precede or at least should coincide with the training and occupational skills. Much of the financial and administrative support for such programs obviously must come from government. But for both practical and philosophical reasons, the McCone Commission hopes that an important share can be provided through private sources, including the Negro community itself. By this method, the middle class, hopefully, can transmit to the lower class not only its skills and knowledge, but perhaps of equal importance, its whole mode of living. The responsibility of the lower class is to become as much like the middle class as possible and thereby to qualify for employment under the conventional circumstances of a free enterprise economy. It's not entirely clear what happens to those who fail or refuse to make this adjustment, but presumably society would be absolved of any further responsibility for the fate of the resistors. Now secondly, a more liberal approach, based at least partially upon our national experience in the 1930s, reflects the assumption that the poor need an immediate income which should not be preconditioned upon self-reform, which in turn, I think, suggests a work relief or public works program or somewhat along the lines of WPA or PWA. These projects would be directed to adults and to out-of-school out of uh, youngsters. The proposal along with the McCone Commission pro uh, proposal, presupposes vast educational advances to qualify in-school youngsters for the higher skilled jobs that are opening up. Many of the projects, that is the public works projects, such as the proposed new hospital for Watts, would serve recognized community needs. Other projects, however, might fall into the make work category. I might add, just as an aside here, and I hope this is not uh, going outside my function, uh, but I, I hope that uh, you will all vote yes on Proposition A, the hospital bond in the election next Tuesday. 
Aside from the financial problem which plagues any proposal, it seems to me that the public works approach faces two special barriers. First of all, in the absence of a situation of mass unemployment as we had in the 1930s, I think it's questionable whether there is a sufficiently solid political basis for this kind of program. And secondly, because of union restrictions and the prevailing recession in residential building construction in Southern California, which the uh, Security First National Bank economists predict predicts will last about another year, uh, with resulting surpluses of workers in the building trades, including even the skilled crafts, there's no guarantee whatsoever that new construction will result in any new jobs for South Los Angeles residents not now on the union rolls. Thirdly, a related but I think a superior proposal is one that I mentioned before. The development of new types of sub-professional jobs in public service, especially in the educational, medical care, recreational, probation and parole, welfare and urban renewal areas. These jobs would be useful. They could provide an immediate income for poor, poor persons. They would vastly improve the quality of service and the effectiveness of programs offered by the various agencies and departments. And they would be reserved for those who currently find it difficult to obtain employment elsewhere. The National Commission on Technology Automation and Economic Progress a commission appointed by the president and containing a number of very distinguished acad uh, academicians, businessmen, and labor leaders <clears throat> unanimously recommended this year that, and I'm quoting, a five-year program be established with the amount of public service employment increased each year, depending upon a previous experience in labor market conditions that an initial sum of perhaps $2 billion be appropriated to provide about 500,000 additional full-time public service jobs, and that the program be coupled with a serious attempt to learn more about the nature and causes of hardcore unemployment by case and survey methods. This is the end of the quotation from the National Commission. Now, fourthly and lastly, the most radical proposal, of course, is the one that is generally associated with the staff of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions up in Santa Barbara and with economist Robert Theobald. And this is the direct payment of income to poor people without a means test and without the precondition of employment. This might take the form of a negative income tax or a vast expansion of welfare assistance without all the onerous regulations that are now attached to it or some other form that's not now yet fully defined. In a strictly economic sense, the elimination of poverty in the United States by this method would, would be quite cheap. It would require about $12 billion in direct income payments to bring all poor families in this country out of poverty as poverty is now officially defined in income terms which is roughly the cost of one year's operations in Vietnam. Our gross national product now runs at a rate that exceeds $720 billion a year. Let me just repeat those figures for you. $12 billion to, el to eliminate poverty in the strictly economic sense, which is about the cost of one year in Vietnam, a gross national product of in, e in excess of $720 billion. Now this proposal, the proposal for direct income payments, deserves further consideration and further exploration, but it seems to me that there is almost no possibility of its adoption within the reasonable future, and certainly not in time to meet the growing, the growing crisis in, in South Los Angeles. Furthermore, and this is perhaps my own interpretation, there is an implication in certain of this reasoning that the poor are essentially unproductive, that they lack any meaningful potential 
and must somehow be supported by society. It's precisely this kind of assumption that leads conservative economists like Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago, who was Barry Goldwater's economic advisor, to advocate a negative income tax. Negative income tax uh, is, uh, as the term might imply, a situation where if your income falls below a certain level, the government automatically pays you a certain amount of money in order to bring it up to uh, the level that is determined to be the minimum subsistence or deprivation level. However, any, any plan, it seems to me, which treats the poor as, as unproductive, whether this is intentional or not, will deny them the full access to the opportunities, power, and the privileges which they deserve. And I think it would leave essentially untouched those very complex psychological and sociological forces which have exploded into violence in every major city of the land. Some form of this proposal, bereft of any invidious implications, may well be the wave of the future, but I would re regret any emphasis upon it at this time when the problems of the central city are urgent and the political basis for a broad social revolution, as I think this would imply, simply does not exist. Where then does this leave us with respect to the McCone Report and the particular problems of South Central Los Angeles? In my own report for the Commission last November, I advocated a job development program along the lines of Governor Brown's program and more recently the proposal of the Automation Commission, a greater emphasis upon on-the-job training as, as opposed to institutional training, the deliberate use of government contracts and, and tax advantages in both carrot and stick fashion to induce employers to hire the hardcore unemployed as trainees, and an expanded and improved system for training of employable persons on the welfare rolls. Again, in that special report, I made reference to some of the proposals that we had advanced in our special report from the Institute of Industrial Relations to the federal government in, 19, in early 1965 making urban pockets of poverty eligible for assistance under the various economic development and uh, legislation, a new GI Bill for everyone, going from the elementary grades through the college grades, federal educational programs in those areas of the country where educational standards, especially for minorities, are woefully inadequate new community centers, many of which would be attached to schools, housing measures to, prom to promote home ownership, further improvements in job referral services and in transportation, and finally a termination of the Bracero Farm Labor Program. Some of these recommendations have been put into effect, at least partially or, or in a preliminary way. The Bracero program is almost dead, I trust. The federal government has allocated two and three quarter billion dollars for a demonstration program to improve transportation facilities in the South Central area. The Labor Department is placing much greater emphasis upon on-the-job training, and both public and private agencies <coughs> have strengthened their job placement efforts. In most cases, however, I doubt that these programs have advanced far enough to affect the lives and the hopes of the people in South Los Angeles. It's difficult indeed for administrators to accept the risks necessarily involved in any program to reach the hardcore unemployed. Their primary orientation has been in an entirely different direction. Thus, when I studied the location of the MT, uh, MDTA institutional training programs, institutional meaning mainly that they are in school rather than on the job, 
At the time of the August riot last year, I found out that most of these programs uh, were in areas such as Van Nuys, Santa Monica, Pasadena, Glendale, North Hollywood, Duarte, and Long Beach. Areas that are far from the South Central area where the problem of hardcore unemployment was admittedly the most severe. There are, I think, probably a great many reasons for this kind of strange pattern. There are industrial concentrations in Santa Monica and Long Beach and the San Fernando Valley. Uh, there's a question, a question of the availability of school facilities, and you can name several, several other reasons. But it seems to me that mo one major reason is the tendency of agencies and departments to play it safe when they are administering programs rather than to take risks with the rather unpredictable members of the hardcore unemployed group. As a result of the riot, there is now an acceleration of activity in the poverty areas, but the old line permanent departments of government still find it very difficult to work effectively with people who are the most disadvantaged. And as some of us who have been working with the departments in this area of job creation for subprofessionals can testify from very personal experience. The road, the road ahead of us, it seems to me, is a rough road because the alienation and frustration characteristic of urban ghettos have now gathered a kind of momentum that may even be irreversible. Integration is resisted by Negroes as well as whites in some parts of Los Angeles. Without pretending to know how deep or pervasive the feeling is, I am a great deal impressed by the concrete evidences of a separatist philosophy in the heart of the disadvantaged ghetto, linked, I think, with a growing consciousness of ethnic identity and heritage. The growing nationalism clashes head-on with the philosophy behind the McCone Commission's report that Negroes must somehow fit themselves for a role in a white-dominated and essentially middle-class society. James Baldwin speaks, I think, for not a few Negroes when he poses the question, do I really want to be integrated into a burning house? We are now reaping the consequences of many centuries of discrimination and, at best, inaction. At a time when many of us have deceived ourselves that the basic problems are well on their way to solution. The civil rights legislation is of only marginal interest, I think, to the people of Watts or South Chicago or Harlem or Oakland. We are only now at the point where we can begin to grapple, if we choose, with the really fundamental problems of economics and sociology in the urban centers. And such problems cannot be approached through business as usual and the conventional processes of bureaucracy. The most hopeful approach to a solution, I think, is through organizations such as VISTA, which is the Domestic Peace Corps, and certain of the community action programs, which mobilize the idealism of some Americans and focus it on practical, short-run objectives. This is somewhere between the conventional wisdom of the American middle class and the social revolutionary fervor of the new left but I fear it may be our only immediate hope. It remains to be seen whether political and institutional pressures will subvert these efforts and render them imp impotent. If that occurs, there will be explosions in the urban ghettos, I think, which dwarf even the most violent of the past. 
despite the acknowledged improvements in our overall economy. Indeed, I think we can count ourselves fortunate if the rage and frustration symbolized in the most extreme form by the nationalists have not already blocked the path to any accommodation. The McCone Report hardly touches these critical issues, but in retro retrospect, I wonder if we ever had the right, really, to expect that it would. There is little point in debating what the McCone Commission should have reported. Rather, we should take the wise counsel of Bayard Rustin and concentrate on building the widest possible coalition of forces around specific goals, the achievement of which can improve the lives and raise the hopes of those who have almost lost hope. In President Kennedy's words, let us begin.